they called the first call and and I didn't pay that much attention. Then they said the second call and somebody somebody came over to me and said me, said the woman was laying up there on the on the rub down table. I went up there and she's laying up there sleeping. I woke her up and said, Come on, Chad. I said, It's time for you to run the hundred. I said, get on up there. She said, okay, she yawned, stretched, got her track shoes, jotted on up there. He will run to this one special seat. And by the time I came underneath the tunnel into the stadium, I could look and see him. Ed Temple, coach of the 1960 U.S. Women's Olympic track team, brought Wilma Rudolph and her Tiger Bell teammates from Tennessee State University all the way to Rome to run against the best in the world. After it was over, somebody said, Wilma won. I said, Wilma won? And then they flashed up on the board there. It was the summer of 1960, and people the world over gathered around TV sets to watch the first widely broadcast Olympics from Rome. American athletes did not disappoint, as viewers at home were treated to a U.S. team packed with surprising talent. It was Jerry West and Oscar Robertson, two future NBA legends who won gold on the basketball court, and an unknown boxer named Cassius Clay, who shocked everyone by making good on what would become a lifetime of boasts. Still, the biggest shocker of all was Wilma Rudolph a skinny black girl from Clarksville, Tennessee, who suffered from polio as a kid. She dominated the track, outrunning everyone to bring home three gold medals. Images of the Tiger Bell's Olympic glories were beamed from Rome into living rooms across the United States. As thrilling as these images were, it was still 1960, and with a turn of the television dial, Americans watched the civil rights movement unfold on the nightly news, with sometimes violent results. There comes a time when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. The Tiger Bell runners from their small, historically black college knew the pressure cooker of the Jim Crow South all too well. But the ladies from Tennessee State, coached by Temple, ran so well that their talent was undeniable, filling the U.S. women's track team roster almost top to bottom. Temple coached the Tiger Bells for 44 years, building one of the most dominant legacies in all of sports. His teams won 34 national track titles and produced 40 Olympians who won 23 Olympic medals. Winner of two gold medals, Barbara Jones, was another star among Temple's Tiger Bells. If you watch Wilma Rudolph's form, you'll see she runs just like this. Because that's what Temple taught us, and we taught Wilma. And that's the reason why Tennessee State was a champion team from 1950 on to 1994. Tiger Bell's results coming in first in the Olympics because that was Temple's philosophy. As African-American women running in a time before desegregation or Title IX, this tradition of winning came in the face of long odds. No coach and no team in any sport overcame greater obstacles to achieve so much on the world's largest stage. And yet, the story of Temple and the Tiger Bells is largely unknown. It was a wonderful feeling, and I say to young people, when you're watching the Olympics, just remember how hard it was for those athletes to get to that podium. Lucinda Williams is another Tiger Bell alumna from Rome 1960. Along with Barbara Jones, Wilma Rudolph, and a fourth Tiger Bell teammate, Martha Hudson, Lucinda was part of the 4x100 relay team. The four Tiger Bells ran their way into the final race, where they served up one of the most exciting Olympic moments from Rome that summer. America's team is made up entirely of Tennessee State U Tiger Bell. They recall the scene before the race as they strode out together onto the track at the famed Stadio Olimpico. When they marched us out and you look around, you see the hundreds of thousands of people. We just said, we know we have to get the baton to Wilma. She says, uh, we got to get this gold medal because uh, I said, we will. When they placed us in our position, I'm on the curb. Gun goes off and Martha starts. It's a terrific start. Barbara picks it up. And I was going to run my very best. The baton gets to me, and I go like I have never gone 
before. And when I get my mark with Wilma, there's a hesitancy. So consequently, the baton does not get in the hand. I said, what is going on? Because that's something we just didn't do. But I do not give up. And I put it in there. And I said, go. As soon as she got that baton, she said, I got to win. She said, get me the baton. She said, we're going to get up on that stage. She said, get me the baton. Wilma delivered on her promise, helping the Tiger Bell set a new world record. We are four African-American girls representing the whole United States of America, being able to stand on that podium and to see our flag going up. Gold medals in hand, the Tiger Bells became overnight sensations among the first black women ever celebrated as bona fide sports stars. The Europeans went wild for Wilma. The Italians called her the Black Gazelle, and to the French, she was the Black Pearl. The world wanted to see Wilma. They wanted to see Wilma in Germany. They wanted to see her in Holland. She can't even put down her sweats or her warm-up shoes. They want to take them. She gets on the bus. They want to rock the bus. Despite their newfound celebrity, Temple and the Tiger Bells returned home to the Jim Crow South and were once again relegated to second-class citizenship. Now, it was great why they come all, came, why come out to the airport, the mayor, the governor, the president, everybody patting you on the back, having assembly at the school, band playing. Boom. Oh. You're right back to zero. Right back to zero. What do you have to do? We done set world records, we done set Olympic records, and no. The mayor and everything said, well, we'll have, a, we'll have two band quits. We'll have one for the, for the blacks and one for the whites. And the woman said, no, we ain't gonna have that. She said, if we don't have one band quit, then we're not gonna have none. In those early days of the civil rights movement, an integrated banquet was no small feat. The Tiger Bells faced the usual racism of the time. Nowhere was this more apparent than when the team set out on the road for a track meet. For this meant a long ride traversing a hostile and segregated country. We knew that number one, we couldn't stop in hotels, we couldn't use the bathrooms, and we could not eat in restaurants. It doesn't sound as sanitary as you would think, but we had jars because we couldn't go to the bathrooms. This is what we encountered. Even coming back after the Olympics, we encountered that. It didn't matter if you were an Olympian. You were told, you know, we don't serve, and you know the word they use. I remember stopping and Coach Temple going into a, a restaurant. And the first thing the man said is, we do not serve niggers. That was my first realization. And that took an effect upon all of us. But here was Coach Temple and he said, never let anyone deter you from meeting your goals and objectives. This is just one incident that is a challenge to you. Stressing the need to face all challenges, Coach Temple shaped his Tiger Bells to be successful black women on and off the track. I would get the grades before they would get them. Now everybody's sitting around that table and I'm going over everybody's grade. Lucy the Williams, now let me see. You had English on so you got a B, that's good. Now what's, what's this D here for in math? Coach Temple just taught us you did your best. You used your God-given talent of athletics and education to let people know that you were the best and that you could compete with anyone. Coach Temple also kept his girls out of harm's way by keeping them cloistered on campus and enforcing a strict regimented schedule. This was especially important for those who hadn't grown up in the South, like Barbara Jones. One of the things my mom feared was for me to go from Chicago down South because I was a person who would speak my mind. But Mr. Temple protected us. He knew where we were every minute on that campus. I have a tendency to be a little hippie. So he said, but Jones, I don't want you eating any cake. 
no sweets. And when I went through the cafeteria line, the cashier said, uh, no pie for you, BJ. Mr. Temple has left orders of what you can eat and what you can't eat. Mm -hmm. He was the meanest man, uh, very strict, uh, but also very humble, um, you know, and he, he took you as you were, but you knew that he meant business. Temple was a motivator. There were no divas on the team. Everybody got the same thing, discipline. It was such a blessing when we got older because it made us better people. It's just a matter of pride that we still have. With Coach Temple's high standards, the Tiger Bells were expected to achieve. Rome 1960 was just the beginning. The Tiger Bells kept winning, scoring victories both on and off the track. Prior to that time, women didn't get invited. So Wilma opened up the doors there, was no doubt about it. They saw what we had to go through and they saw that women can do. They couldn't help but come through and say, hey, we gotta do something for women. Along with the fight for racial equality, the legacy of the Tiger Bells helped forge the way for a generation of female athletes with the eventual passage of Title IX. And that's one of the things that kept us going help us wanting to do well so that others could look back and say they did it, then I can do it too. A young girl can say that. And so I believe that we were trailblazers to set the stage for others to come. <laughs>